Okay, so sometimes the handhelds go off, so you just swap them out. It's really bizarre. They end up interfering. Then um, it's okay. Because faculty have their faculty. So there were a lot more who were interested. All right, you ready? Okay. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for making time today to come by and listen to Dr. Snyder as he talks to us about the 150 years here on Mare Island before Toro was here. And specifically, I think you're going to talk about the medical hospital complex that Toro now sits on. So it's truly my pleasure to welcome Dr. Tom Snyder here today. Uh, Tom actually grew up in rural New York State. He graduated from Lafayette College, which is in Pennsylvania. He had a BA in chemistry. So he and I have something in common because I also was a chemistry undergrad. Uh, he was a beneficiary, beneficiary of the Navy's Vietnam era Ensign 1915 program. And Tom graduated from Albany Medical College with both an MD and a commission in the Naval Medical Corps. After a surgical internship in Chicago, he served three years of Navy active duty on destroyers and at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Hence how you got here to California the first time, right? <laughs> Upon completion of his active service, Tom returned to Chicago for a urology residency at Rush Medical College. While reading Herman Walk's The Winds of War, he was inspired to join the Navy Reserve. And 24 years later, he retired after enjoying a variety of operational command and senior staff billets. His highest military award is the Meritorious Service Medal, and he's a Vietnam veteran. After residency, Tom and his family returned to California for the second time. <laughs> where he enjoyed a busy surgical and administrative practice with the Kaiser Permanente organization for the last or for 21 years. Leaving operating suite and clinic behind, Tom has sought to combine his medical and military interests along with his first love of history. Although I'm guessing somewhere along the line, somebody told you to get a, a, to get a degree where you could get a job, right? <laughs> Among his projects is a history of the Navy's first West Coast Hospital, which is right here on the Toro University campus. Tom is founder and executive director of the Academic Society for the History of Navy Medicine, and it's organized to support research, study, and writing in the history of maritime medicine. He's immediate past Commodore of the San Francisco Commandary of the Naval Order of the United States, and he serves on the Solano County Historical Records Commission. He blogs on the history of maritime medicine at Of Ships and Surgeons, and it's my great pleasure to welcome him to Toro today to share with us his knowledge of our history. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Provost Fleischer, and uh, thank you all for coming this afternoon. I know you guys have terrifically busy schedules and uh, your brains are chock full of stuff, but uh, I hope to be able to add a little a little bit more and, 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 and have some fun at the same time. So uh, as, as the provost indicated, oh, I started out as a history major in undergraduate school, but the, the reading was impossible and science was so much easier. And so I made that transition, and you know that's the, the rest they say is is, is, is history. Um, but anyway, so I have this abiding interest in history, and by luck, by luck, you know, I live in Vallejo, California. The Navy's first hospital on the West Coast just happened to be across the Napa River from where I live, and I thought, well, what a wonderful way to combine my medical, my naval, and my historical interests to research the history of this. 
It turns out that the, the, the narrative of this history really lives in the correspondence that went back and forth between the hospital commanders here in Mare Island and the Navy's Bureau of Medicine and Surgery back in D.C. And lo and behold, that entire correspondence is, is preserved in the National Archives in Washington, D.C. So right after I retired, I went to D.C. and I got my researcher card at the, at the National Archives. And about once a quarter, I could walk into the place, fly back, stay with an old Navy friend of mine, and walk into the place and for a couple of weeks uh, present my card and ask for materials from Air Island. An hour or two later, the researchers would bring out, the archivists would bring out this book, these uh, carts of dusty old books. My son, when he'd see me, would say, ah, Pop, I know where you were today. You've got that book, old book dust all over your jacket, you know. So it was this lovely opportunity to, to, to do the textual research. Uh, that textual research took about 10 years. Now, my pitch here, and I'm going to read this because I think this is important. The rest of it's going to be pretty much off the cuff. Um, those who cannot, this is a quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Thus, statesman, philosopher Edmund Burke, or statesman, historian Winston Churchill, or philosopher George Santayana. Beyond the avoidance of errors of historical ignorance, Santayana hit upon another value of history. He wrote, Quote, progress far from consisting in change depends on retentiveness. When change is absolute, there, there remains no being, to improve, no being to improve and no direction is set for possible improvement. And when experience is not retained, as among savages, infancy is perpetual. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. That is, and now I'm, I, that's close quote, that is, if we continue to have to reinvent the wheel, we'll never conceive of the wing. Santayana seems to be telling us that our history is a base upon which we can build improvement. And I would add, looked upon properly, our history can be a motivator for progress that Santayana imagined. So the little arrow points to a sign. This, this statue lies outside of the, uh, the researcher entrance to the National Archives in, on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., and the plaque, which you can't say, is a quote, what is past is prologue. So what about our past and the prologue for our future here at Mare Island? The story starts really with the establishment of the Navy's Pacific Squadron in 1821. We hadn't had ships in the Pacific. We hadn't had Navy in the Pacific before that period of time, but we did have ships of commerce. By 1821, our commerce in the Pacific was significant. Uh, the, and, and interestingly enough, e e even though the War of 1812 was passed, the British were still not particularly friendly, uh, and they were not adverse to, for instance, stopping American commercial ships in the middle of the ocean, searching the crew for, for possible subjects to the crown, and snatching them off the American ships for use within the Royal Navy. Uh, sailors got shipwrecked. Sailors got into legal trouble. And it was considered that we should have a fleet of ships on the Pacific to look out after our interests here. Originally, the, the fleet was the, the squadron was perhaps two to five ships. And before California became a state, they were home ported in Callao, which is in Peru, and in Valparaiso, Chile. So you can see the, the, the uh, ships would range throughout the Pacific up as high as what is now the Oregon, the Canadian border, out to the Sandwich Islands, the Hawaiian Islands, and beyond, keeping interest, protecting American interest in the Pacific. The need for an anchorage in North America was very clear. Gold was discovered in California in 48. Two years later, a very rapid progression of politics, the state became a state. You know, money talks, gold talks, gold's discovered, we want you as a state. It becomes a state in 1850. The Navy had actually sent commissions of officers out to the West Coast in 48 and in 52 to seek a place for the anchorage for the, for the Pacific Squadron. And in 1852, a commission led by Commodore Sloat chose Mare Island. Now, what's interesting about that story is when the Navy commission was sent out to the West Coast to look for anchorage, they did not look in Southern California. So San Diego was not looked at. L.A. was not locked at, looked at. But they spent a month or more looking, uh, surveying the, uh, the, the uh, San Francisco Bay before they chose Mare Island as an ideal place, well protected from the weather, 
also well protected from the predations of the Royal Navy should they seek to come after us because you could hide in the north end of the bay. Two years later, in 1854, Commander Farragut and his family arrived. Uh, he brings with him a detailed map of the naval shipyard that was proposed. And what's interesting is where the blue circle is, is a, about a 400 foot square designated naval hospital. So it's very clear that the Navy intended to have a hospital out here right from the beginning. Now, you remember the name Farragut because later on he became famous in the Civil War, his, his, his bringing his fleet into, uh, into New Orleans. His line was, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, all dramatic stuff. He goes on to become the first admiral of the United States Navy, and, and, and you see Farragut's name all over the Pacific and, and in fact, in Washington, D.C. There are two... Uh, there are two uh, subway stations named after Farragut. Two days after Farragut arrives, he, he calls the sloop of war Warren over from Sausalito. Uh, it's a very small ship, uh, but it's, it's going to serve as the first medical facility on Mare Island. Now, this image, uh, the Navy normal, the, the, as far as I can tell, there are there is a photograph or an image of every ship that's ever been commissioned in the Navy, except for the sloop of war Warren. I was I was at uh, I was uh, docenting at the McCune collection of books at the at the JFK Library down, downtown one day when a man came in and he picked chose this big tall uh, white leather bound book off the shelf and started leafing through it. I sat next to him because you know that that people are, are known to take knives and cut pages out of books. So you always have a docent sitting next to the person who's looking at books. Well, as he's leafing through, I see ships, pictures of ships. And it turns out this uh, this was a book published uh, by, by uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, a collection of images created by Gunner William Mon Myers, then aboard the sloop of war Dale, a sister ship to our ship in 1848-1849. And this drawing is his drawing of the sloop of war Warren. So that's what she looked like. You can see three boats in the background approaching a ship. They're doing what's called a cutting out expedition. Uh, that ship in the background was, was, was taken by pirates. And the Navy is sending a crew of men to grasp that ship, snatch it, and bring it back to its rightful owner. There was a medical officer on that ship, John Mills Brown. He graduated from the medical department of Harvard University in 52 and entered the Navy as an assistant surgeon a year later. His first duty was aboard Warren. He's the first doctor, Navy doctor, uh, uh, on Mare Island. Now, I like to tell this story. Now, this is him, obviously, uh, a, as an older man. This is actually, this picture is actually on the walls of the, uh, oh, yes, the, um, the, it'll come to me. He was he was a mason. So the, mason, the mason's lodge up on the hill, up behind Vallejo, he was a grand master of, of the local mason's lodge back in the day. So he was a, he was a pretty famous mason. In fact, uh, there was there was at one time a bla brass plaque down on the near the down near the main street in Mare Island des from the masons, indicating that he was a, a, a local mason of prominence. That brass plaque, like lots of brass from Mare Island, has disappeared. More, you'll hear more about him shortly. I like this uh, slide because this is some statistics of medical care back in that time. The statistic I like the best is the bottom line. The daily average cost per man for health care at the Maryland Naval Hospital, they measured in, in tenths of mills, a mill being a tenth of a cent. Okay, so we're talking about hundreds of pennies. So that's accounting to how many decimal places? Uh, the sloop of war Warren was small and, and very uncomfortable, and a couple of years later, the USS Independence replaced Warren as the health care facility on Mare Island. And this is a picture of Independence later when she became the receiving ship at Mare Island. The receiving ship is where in naval facilities, when you check into Mare Island, you check in through the re receiving ship. And when you leave Mare Island, that is when you're assigned here for duty, you go out through the, through the, uh, the receiving ship. But this ship also, dismasted and covered over, served as a healthcare facility on Mare Island for some time. 
Uh, I like this comment from William Bishop, Surgeon William Bishop, who wrote to the Bureau in 1863, particularly in the winter season. She's a very unsuitable place to treat the sick. It is cold and wet and open to every wind that blows. And any of you who've been outside on Mare Island in the wintertime get that message very clearly. One of the things, one of the interesting things about the research uh, at the archives is that at this period of time, of course, all the correspondence was handwritten. And, and the handwriting was, you know, they had, they had scribes who did this, yeoman who did the writing, sometimes difficult to, to read, not a lot of volume, but they wrote like this. I mean, this is, you know, this is part of a report. The cold, it's cold and wet and open to every wind that blows. In about 1890, the typewriter replaced handwriting the volume of material instantly increased. It was so much easier to put stuff on paper. The quality of the writing also decreased substantially. Surgeon Harlan of USS Saranac wrote, in part, a better shelter is needed for patients than a ship off San Francisco where gusts of cold wind make every invalid shudder. Don't you just love it? Now, they were trying to pitch something here, right? Well, we need, we need a hospital. We need a hospital on land, a proper building. This is 1863, 1864. Recall what was going on in our country at that time. It was the Civil War. So the government was prosecuting the Civil War. They were too involved with that business to worry about a little Navy station out on the West Coast and the health care of a few ships and a few sailors. So what happens is, here we go. We'll get it. There we are. In April 1st, 1863, Surgeon Bishop, who was assigned to Mare Island, uh, proposed that, they con that a, 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 an unused granary be converted for the use as a hospital on Mare Island. Um, he submitted it with a cost that was somewhere around $3,000, um, and he received approval to do this. Now, this picture is actually on the walls at, uh, at Sutter Solana Hospital and is proposed as being the first Navy hospital on the West Coast. What I like about historical research is um, I, can, I can confirm that that's the case. Uh, let's go here. Now what's happening? I've lost, there we go. Okay, so to get back to our, to our narrative here, Platon Vallejo, MD, a story or two. So you, you, you know, of course, that Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo was the last Mexican governor of California. And Vallejo was actually very much pro-American. He was quite happy when California became a state. One of his sons, Platon, and Platon is Plato in Spanish, uh, became, the, it turns out, was the first Californio, the first uh, person of Hispanic origin uh, from California, native of California, who attended an American medical school. He graduated from Columbia, we now call it PNS Physicians and Surgeons in New York. Uh, the local mythology was that he graduated second in his class. I, call, I emailed the Alumni Association at Columbia and said, is this true? And they emailed me back, well, we can't say that because at that time it was a pass-fail system. No letter grades were given. But what we can tell you is that his graduating thesis on the secretions of the kidneys won second prize that year, hence the mythology. Platon Vallejo went on to, uh, after graduation, became a surgeon in the Army during the Civil War. After, the, after that, he uh, came back to California and went to work for the Pacific Mail Packet Company. It was a, a, a ship transportation agency off the coast. He worked for them for, as a doctor for several years and then actually established practice in Vallejo. He had a long and distinguished practice retiring at about age 81. His prescription book is at the downtown library, at the, the downtown museum at, uh, on, on Marin Street. Um, as prescriptions in those days, he didn't write a prescription for penicillin, tabs, 31 POQID. They were formulas. They were, and, and, and the formulas were proprietary to each physician. They were secret formulas. And, and one of the, uh, the ethics of the pharmacists were you didn't share Dr. Jones's formulas with Dr. Smith and vice versa. Well, uh, uh, Vallejo's prescription book is in, in the museum. It's unreadable because most of it's in Latin. And of course, the drugs that were used and the medic medicaments that were used in those days are somewhat mysterious to us now. 
The other story I like to tell about Platten was at one point in that little granary of a hospital, a sailor who had been shot in the rump during a, uh, an anti-piratical action off the Mexican coast was in the hospital and was not doing well. He was in constant pain. He was losing weight. He was clearly, we would say, uh, being a, it was a failure to thrive. Um, and finally, the surgeons decided, you know, you'd probably be better off if we just took the hip joint off. They'd figured out by probing it, there were no x-rays in those days, that there were probably seven or eight fragments that the ball had lodged in the hip and had just shattered his hip joint. So... Platon Vallejo was one of the, quote, eight surgical gentlemen present at the operation. He was performed under nitrous anesthesia. The patient survived, and he walked out of the hospital three months later. How do you walk out without a hip joint? The orthopedist here will tell you that the body creates pseudo joints. They also fitted him out with an apparatus that had straps around his chest and a gimmick that went down along the side of his leg and was strapped to his leg to stabilize the joint so he could walk out of the hospital. 1869, finally, John MacArthur, a Philadelphia architect, is contracted to create a hospital for Mare Island, California. This is the front of the architectural drawing that he provided. It's an elegant Edwardian, I guess, is the style. Um, it, is, it is done in the pavilion style of hospital building. That is to say you have a central core and you have uh, wings coming off of both sides that are pavilions. This is a style of hospital building, building that was advocated by Florence Nightingale, for instance, as a way of, of preventing contagion from moving from one part of the hospital to the other by having separate wings or separate pavilions. <clears throat> it's clear, or it soon will become clear, that MacArthur had never stepped foot in California because this hospital was entirely masonry construction, entirely masonry construction, and the water supply was going to be rain collected from the, from the roof and routed into cisterns in front of the hospital. Surgeon Brown, the man that we met earlier with a, with a nice mustachio, and a civil engineer by the name of Brown were appointed supervisors for construction. Bids were let, ultimately seven bidders, and actually the bidding, took, took, bidding process took two times because the bids came in too high. But finally, the winner, Dennis Jordan of San Francisco, came in at $148,000, 20% lower than his other competitors. Now, I had to go back for a minute and say, so why were things so expensive in California? Big surprise, right? Well, it turns out that during the Civil War, the, 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 Ameri the, the American government came off of the gold standard and printed currency. It was called legal tender. Uh, and and it was backed by, I mean, the saying at the time was, if you turn the dollar bill over, there was a lot of green ink on the back. That was the, old, the, the, the money wasn't backed by anything of value, like gold. It was just backed by the ink on the back, hence the old term greenback. Well, as it turns out, there was a terrible inflation here. And, it, 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 and at, at some points, things would cost 50% more in legal currency than they would in illegal tender than they would in coin. So th these bids were set in legal tender, and so they would be 50% higher. Congress had set a budget of 100000 initially for the hospital. Anyway, so Dennis Jordan's secret was he'd walked the property, and he realized that where the hospital was going to be built, it was clay. And when he was going to dig out the, f the, the cellar for this hospital, he could take that clay and burn it into bricks. So he made his own bricks, a million and a half of them. That cut out the middleman, right? The middleman, the transport costs and all that jazz. You just made your own bricks. Those bricks are still there. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. So this is the hospital when it was first built. 18. This is probably a little later than 1871. Two reasons why I know that, or we have indication of that. One of them is the windmill, and the other is the building with something going up to the hospital. So I remember I said the water supply was going to be water from rain. Well, they ran out of water the first year, of course. <laughs> so the next thing they did is they put a pump in run by a windmill. That water in there, there was a ravine that ran down along the hospital there. That water was brackish, so they had to build a still to distill the water, and they still ran out of water. 
So then they would send ships out with tanks and get water from local rivers. And they continually had problems with water until about 1895 when they piped. Well, if the next thing they did was they got water from the city of Vallejo. Uh, the reservoir was up where up, up underneath the uh, Six Flags at Lake Chabot. Well, they ran out of water a couple of years in a row. So finally, they ended up piping water in from Green Valley, 25 miles away. After that, I never heard another thing about water problems until World War II. The other, so I thought, oh, so this is probably the distilled water line. Well, it turns out it's not because another part of this thing, they, they, they uh, cooked coal to make gas. And that's a gas line that goes up to provide uh, gas for lighting in the hospital. So this is, I love this about historical research. This was, in, this was in the archives. The date is February 1st, 1871. It's letter number two. Letter number one was not in the file. It says, sir, I have the honor to report this institution ready for the reception of patients. I am very respectfully your obedient servant, John Brown, surgeon in charge. So that's the official day of opening of that first hospital. Uh, the gent who had his hip joint, uh, his hip joint resected, he, he walked out of this hospital, not out of, not out of the, uh, out of the granary. So 1871, 1875 to, nine, to, uh, to 1900 is a quarter century of amazing technologic change. It's kind of equivalent to what we're going through now, I think. First gas, then electricity for lighting. Well, first candles, then gas, or, or lanterns, then gas, and then electricity for lighting. Telephones for internal and external con uh, communication. I've already talked about a reliable water supply. And finally, a purpose-built operating room. And what's one of the interesting aspects of the, of the correspondence back and forth was there was at that time very little, almost no top down direction. The local commander was expected to know what he was doing. If you wanted to write for advice back to the bureau, he could do that. But very rarely did the bureau come down saying, you will do this, this and this. Except in about 1890, 1891, when a letter went out to every naval hospital in the world saying, modern medicine and modern surgery requires that we have a proper and dedicated operating room. Therefore, you will do such and such and so and so. You will use this paint for the walls, this paint for the overhead. You will use this particular Navy issue operating table and sterilizers and safe operating light that won't, uh, that won't uh, explode uh, uh, ether anesthesia. And so the operating room the operating room was created. This is a remarkable accomplishment, remarkable enough to be remarked on by correspondents when after the operating room was instituted, a letter goes back to the Bureau saying, last night we performed our first emergency surgical operation under artificial lighting in the operating room to the great satisfaction of all concerned. Remarkable. 1892, a commanding officer's quarters are built. It's a beautiful structure, I think. Its, it, it's position would have been on the, in the parking lot just up behind the hospital. Um, the, the Navy tore it out after, after the Navy hospital closed to create a parking lot for a clinic, which was run out of, out of the uh, sick officer's quarters here for a while. But So this was built in 1892. So you say, well, where did the commanding officer of the hospital live before that? He lived on the first floor of the hospital with his family. This was considered to be somewhat gauche at the time because you would have your family rubbing elbows with common everyday sailors. It was not well thought of. And every year after the hospital was opened, the CEO would write back to the Bureau saying, as part of your budget for next year, I'd like $10,000 for a house. The Surgeon General would duly include that in his report to the, to the uh, Secretary of the Navy, who would duly include that in part of his report to Congress, and it would get turned down until 1891, so 20 years after the hospital opened. In 1898, we have the Mare Island earthquake. I was in the archives leafing through, and the first thing was a telegram that said, serious earthquake last night, uh, hospital seriously damaged, uh, report to follow. Well, you had act I had access to the Internet, so quickly I opened my, my computer, looked in the Internet, and sought out Earthquake, Mare Island, 1898, and lo and behold, it is called the Mare Island Earthquake, estimated at Richter 6.5. The hospital was seriously damaged. Now, it didn't fall down, and I have to go back for a minute to tell you why. 
the 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 remember the Browns, the surgeon Brown and the engineer Brown. They realized what, what, as the hospital was being constructed, they wrote back to the bureau saying, you know, we've noticed that masonry chimneys out here don't do real well in earthquakes. So we recommend that you put steel reinforcements in the corners of the building and put steel strapping around the building at a cost. And they actually cited the cost down to the penny, not the mill, but the penny. The bureau said, fine, go ahead and do it. I'm convinced that that foresight probably saved the sailors' lives who were in that hospital because it did not fall. Nevertheless, they were evacuated and moved to a nearby Marine Corps barracks, which served as a naval hospital for the next couple of years. The Navy and the Marines very nicely worked out the arrangements. The Navy would pay, Navy would pay for half the cost of expense, half the expense of electricity and heat and stuff like that while, while the patients were there. Meanwhile, on 4 May, so remember the, the, the earthquake is on 28 March, 31 March, less than, you know, just a little over a month later. All right, all right. Here we go. Congress appropriates $100,000, and, uh, and they specify that the new hospital will be, will be built on the foundation of the old hospital. So I said, Dennis Jordan Bricks, Dennis Jordan Bricks were still there. They were reputed to be very good quality when they were made. Clearly, they survived the earthquake, and so the foundation on the main hospital building are still Dennis Brown Bricks, and I'll tell you a little bit about that again. So now a DC ar uh, architect by the name of Poindexter is engaged to produce the plans, and this time, maybe the architectural trade had learned that you don't use masonry in an earthquake country because he specified that the construction be of uh, Oregon fir. And that's the hospital that you now know as the main hospital at Mary Island, H1, which opened in, in 1900. I add a picture that was actually taken about, 18, about 1918 by the commanding officer of the hospital showing what his office looked like. It was a pretty Spartan affair, I would submit. Now, one of my theses when I talk about this is that, um, that uh, medical science was advancing a lot at that time and one of the ways that the profession sought to symbolize that was by building buildings to represent the, the, the advances. And there are a couple of buildings on the Maryland complex that I think do that. One is the contagious hospital that was built in 1903. I mean, the bacterial theory of disease has been well established, and the bacterial cause of disease, and so on and so forth. So we now have a contagious hospital to, hot, to, uh, uh, to sequester contagious patients. Well, in practical terms, the only contagious patients that were uh, typically were hospitalized here were TB patients which makes sense. There was no, I mean, TB was contagious by respiratory means, uh, and you, you could isolate them. The other were the syphilitics. Syphilitics, yeah, the, the guys with syphilis. Uh, venereal disease, and you know, I mean, so you sequester them. Okay. Anyway, so now 1903, we get junior medical officers' quarters. You will recognize these houses. They're on the main drag coming in on, into the campus. They're up to the right. There are two houses right next to each other. Beautiful buildings. Uh, I have picked. I'm sorry, I don't have them here, but they have lovely walnut uh, uh, or, or oak and wainscoting. I mean, they're really quite lovely buildings. They were referred to as cottages at the time. I think they're eight-room cottages. I'm not sure. Um, again, so where did the junior medical officers live before that? They lived in the hospital. Now the argument it was, though, we need the hospital space because we're really getting full. I mean, the War of 18, uh, the, the Spanish-American War, now America's got possessions in the Pacific. We're going to have a much larger Navy in the Pacific. We need hospital space. We need space for patients. So move the junior medical officers out, and uh, let, we can use the hospital for, for patients. Now, junior medical officers here mean there are two. One was the executive officer of the hospital, the number, number two in command, really and the chief surgeon. Not necessarily junior, but that's what they were referred to. Female nurses arrive. So during the Spanish-American War, the Army had female nurses. The Navy looked at that, and they thought, gee, that's a really good idea. Uh, because before that, in Navy hospitals, well, in Army hospitals before that too, the nurses were typically uh, patients who were recovering from illness. They would be taught on the job how to empty bedpans or change dressings or whatever. But the, the female nurses in the Army were, had done such an excellent and professional job that the Navy wanted them. 
So after this, after the the Spanish American War, the Surgeon General of the Navy would send up to the to the to the Secretary of the Navy that we need a nurse corps. And every year, every year, the Secretary of the Navy would send it to the Congress, and it would get turned down until 1907, when legislation and approval was given to establish a Navy nurse corps. The next year. In 1909, Miss Martha Pringle, one of the best, if not the best of nurses in the Corps, was detailed to come to Mare Island. Uh, she looks like a formidable woman. <laughs> and I think you would have to be formidable to be the first woman out here in the, in the provinces, out here on the frontier. Uh, she, she was the sole nurse for a couple of years, and, the, and the, the doctors were writing back to the Bureau at this point, you know she's getting awfully lonesome being out here all by herself. We need more nurses, and so ultimately more nurses began to be sent. I'm going to fast forward a little bit to World War I. This is emergency construction. Uh, during World War One, these were these were two or three story. I guess they're three story Navy pavilions. They were, were built separate from the main hospital. Um, the notion was we're at war. We're going to have people coming back from the war. Except, wait a minute. The war was in Europe. It wasn't out here. It just happens that bureaucracies work that way sometimes. Well, we've got money to build emergency hospitals. We'll do it. But maybe it was providential because. What happens in 1918 is we have the, uh, influ the terrible Spanish flu influ influenza epidemic. Um, at the beginning of the epidemic, so the epidemic in America, as far as the Navy is concerned, the epidemic started near Boston. And it spread centrifugally across the country from Boston. And after it hit Chicago, the, the Navy base in Chicago, the doctors in Chicago wrote to the doctors at Mare Island saying, here is our experience. Of the people you have, the Navy people and civilian people you have on the yard, uh, X percent will get the flu, and of those, X percent will get pneumonia. So the guys out here simply did their mathematics, and they realized that the people, that the estimated number of pneumonia patients was just about the number of hospital beds we actually had in both the hospital building that I showed you, but also these temporary structures, and the rest they put up tents for. Now, tents in November in, in, in California is not a bad place to be. I mean, it's maybe cool, but it's bracing. And they're doing their public health right. They're getting these people out of the community because it's very contagious. And, in, and Vallejo was terrifically impacted. This was wartime. I mean, we actually had shipyard workers hot bunking in rental places. I mean, one guy would get up to go to work and another guy would go to bed. And by shifts, three shifts a day, every 24 hours, these beds were being, being used. So there was a lot of exposure. So once a guy was diagnosed, you brought him in. Uh, they also had no idea what the cause of this was. Viruses, except for the tobacco mosaic virus, which is a huge virus, had not been described yet. They went about treating, you know, it's like everything else. You use the last war, you fight the last war now. So the last flu epidemic was due to a bacterium called inf uh, Haemophilus influenzae. So they were treating these guys with spraying their throats with carbolic acid. Um, obviously, it didn't work. The medical officer here, this young fellow, uh, was one of two medical officers who died of flu at uh, Mare Island. Uh, a couple of nurses died, um, and it was and and it was a terribly busy time. These guys would hit the the young and it was mostly fellows back in those days. Young fellows, the influenza affected young people much more than it did older people. And I mean, it was a fulminating disease. They would present to the hospital feeling poorly in the morning and be dead by four in the afternoon. It was just awful. And the stress on the, on the staff and the crew was just terrible. Um, by, the, by the time the flu had waned, around Christmas time, the commanding officer thought he ought to do something to improve morale. So he set up a, uh, a, decorating, a war decorating contest, and the people were sent out into the countryside to find the decorations. I found these pictures. The commanding officer at the time was an amateur photographer. And so at the time, they were sending weekly letters back to the Bureau sort of reporting on the flu. He would include a packet of photos in every one of his letters. I'm convinced that 
these letters had not, these pictures had not seen the light of day since 1918. And here they were, oh, as every letter I opened, there was another set of these wonderful pictures that you get an idea of what it's like, uh, what it looks like on the inside of a Naval, Naval Hospital in 1918. Uh, we finally get a nurse's home in 19... Remember, the nurses came to Mare Island in 1909. We finally get a nurse's home in 1918. Before that, they lived in town, and the commanding officer of the hospital wrote back every year saying, we need a nurse's residence on, on Mare Island because these women dressed in white, in the summertime, it's dusty and dirty on their wagon ride back to their place in town, and in the wintertime, it's wet and muddy on their, dirt, on their way back to town. Uh, we need a place in town in, on the island, and so they finally built this. I love this other picture. This is, again, done by that medical officer who is an am amateur photographer. This is the nurse's residence at night. This is, was a band shell, the, the foundation of the band shell, shell still stands out there, but I, I think it's a lovely evocative photo. Um, more, more construction to prove scientific medicine, a laboratory building in, nine, in 22, and then what's this? Men? It's a power lawnmower, circa 1920. He made that picture. He also made these pictures. This commanding officer in particular, his name was Fahrenholt, and sought to enhance, uh, to make the environment a more healing environment. I talk in my, I, I write about and I talk about the notion that medical officers in the military wear two hats. They wear their medical, uh, they wear their officer hat, in which they represent the interest of the military, and they wear their medical hat, in which they represent the interest of the patients. And the question always is, which interest wins out? And I would argue that the vast majority of times, it's the medical interest that wins out. And here's an example. I mean, he spent construction money to put in beautiful pools to create a healing environment. One of those pools is out behind the hospital. As a matter of fact, and when I was giving this lecture a few years ago here, it was the students here who said, wait, you know what? It's out there. We used to be covered up by grass and stuff like that, and it's out there now. Uh, it doesn't have water in it, and it doesn't have its lights, but it's there. Also, entertainment. I love the Trixie to cheer men at the hospital. That must have been, I don't know, but boxing was a big deal back in those days. Uh, this is another example of innovation on Mare Island. This is an ambulance boat. Think of the Bay Area back in the days before bridges. How do you get people from one place to the other? You do it by boat. Uh, this is actually an old uh, yard tug that's converted to ambulance use, and it has bunks. It actually has a small galley to, to prepare food, and this is the way you could move people around the Bay Area. They made two more of these things. They went to Norfolk, Virginia, and disappeared from history. This boat was in use until 1936. Uh, here's another advance in science. Uh, a psychiatry becomes a, a viable and respected specialty. Uh, the psychiatrists were called alienists in those days, so this is the alienist hospital. You will note when you walk by that the windows in the second level are covered by mesh, by steel, by iron grating. Uh, and that's, uh, here you remember your Latin, this is to prevent uh, people from committing suicide by defenestration. You know the Latin term for window is fenestra. So you don't want people jumping out of the windows to commit suicide. From the time our hospital, the H1, the main hospital up there, was built, being made of wood, the worry was fire. And so every year the commanding officer would write back to the Bureau saying, we need fireproof construction, we need fireproof construction. And finally in 1926, these buildings, uh, the, the building on your left is a ward building for enlisted people, the building on the right is for sick officers. The, in the Navy, enlisted men and officers don't mix. They never did. When I was on my ship, I lived in, quote, officer country, and if a corpsman needed to come back to talk to me, he knocked on the door and requested permission to enter officer's country. That's loosened up a lot now because sailors are so darn smart, and there's, you know, there's so much give and take, but back in the day, this is a very traditional sort of deal. Uh, 1926, now the building that you see to, uh, when you're facing the building to the left of the building went in in about 1932. During the height of the Depression, uh, there wasn't labor. And so it took several years to build that building. You say it was a depression. There must have been labor. Well, there was so much make-work stuff, the Works Progress Administration and other make-work projects in the Bay Area, that they sucked up the labor. So literally it took two or three years to build that other ward building. 
The beginning of the end of the hospital started in November 1941 when the Surgeon General of the Navy, an ENT doc, um, uh, actually FDR's ENT doc, became the Surgeon General and it ended up being a guy by the name of Ross McIntyre, was a brilliant administrator, it turns out. And, and, and the example that I give is that at the beginning of the war, the Navy had 19 ho hospitals around the world. One of them at Kanyakao in the Philippines was taken over by the Japanese. So we really started with 18. By the end of the war, we had 99. I mean, he oversaw the expansion of the naval medical establishment. We had f something like 800 doctors in the Navy at the beginning of the war. We had 19,000 at the end of the war. So he was a genius of administration in overseeing this huge ad advancement. He also saw that the Mare Island Naval Hospital was past its prime. It was small. It was old. You couldn't expand it because you had the hill and the golf course behind. You had the industrial plant of Mare Island in front. And you worried that if the Japanese did do bombing runs, e even if they were aiming, not aiming, for the hospital. Bombing in those days was not all that accurate. The, the hospital was at risk for bombing. So he sent his representatives out in the Bay Area to look for sites for, for uh, other hospitals. And this is part of the report that went back to the DC. Back to DC. You'll recognize the shell symbol. This was a shell roadmap. They didn't have PowerPoint back in those days. He sent a shell roadmap back with a couple of areas marked, one down here in the South Bay. Now, up there is Alameda. You can see Alameda up there. That's where uh, injured sailors and, and, uh, and Marines would be brought in by air or by ship. Uh, and it turns out this big circle with the square up there, the, or, or the X up there, close to, to Alameda, it was, an un, was an old uh, country club that had, had closed during the Depression, uh, the Oak Knoll Country Club. And that ultimately was chosen as a site for a hospital to replace Mare Island, became known as the Oak Knoll Naval Hospital. So war, uh, the, the Japanese attack on 7 December, on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day, the first patients, 179 of them, arrive at Mare Island. Now these are the sickest of the sick and the most severely injured. Uh, those of you who, are, who are in, have gone through your residency, I don't know about you, but I used to, we used to complain bitterly if we had two or three admissions a night. These are 179 of the sickest of the sick. Um, and I, I mean, Mayor Island got, got, got ramped up at that point. We'd already called in the reservists and stuff like that. And in fact, part of my reserve story is There we go. Part of my reserve story is another example of Mare Island innovation, a treatment for burns. Now, the standard treatment for burns back in those days was you painted it with, it was, a, it was you boil tree bark in water and you painted the extract on the wounds and it would create a false, uh, an artificial scab, uh, an eschar. But in order to see how the wound was healing, you would have to peel that off and it hurt like hell. So uh, uh, one of the reservists who had been called up to Mare Island, I think he was a dermatologist, proposed using paraffin, Vaseline, cod liver oil, and a sulfa drug in a solution and spray it on using a flit gun. Now, none of you here probably ever heard of flit guns unless you grow up on a farm. Flit, gun, flit was actually a petroleum-based bug spray. And you put the bug spray in that little canister and then you and spray it and it would spray the it would spray the bug spray well they used these flit guns to spray it on the burns i'm sorry for the quality of this picture but i think what tells the tale is the guy the burn victim has got a big old smile on his face right so that was the thing is it, it caused instant pain relief and it left the burns unbandaged so, so they could be easily observed how did i how did i come to find this or discover this well there was correspondence back to the bureau saying the guys from time life and sports illustrated are here and they want to do an article on our burn treatment can i have your approval to release it well, the concern, obviously, was we don't want to tell our enemies our secrets. But two weeks later, the Bureau writes back saying, sure, go ahead and let them publish this. It's good publicity for the Navy. Psychiatric, how am I doing on time? I guess I'm doing okay. For Ten minutes, okay. Psychiatric, uh, psychiatry. So, so psychiatric injuries of war have been known since the beginning of time. I mean, there's, there's a, a Greek play called Ajax, where the where the where the where the hero is the number two warrior in Athens, and he goes berserk and causes untold 
untold damage and and then becomes contrite i mean you as you read the narrative it is a perfect description of what we today understand as ptsd during the civil war it was called so soldier's heart they had heart dif difficulties in world war 1 it was called shell shock or war neurosis between the wars the psychiatric community figured that they could test people for susceptibility for this stuff well uh, there's a there's a, a, a British historian by the name of Max Hastings who's written a one volume history on World War II, and in one of his chapters he describes the Australians fighting the Japanese in New Guinea, and you would fight your way up a hill against a determined enemy. It was hot, it was humid, there were bugs, the food was terrible, the clothing literally rotted off your body. You would fight up, and then the enemy would push you back down the hill and you would fight your way back up and his argument was that war is hell and every man has a point at which he will break so what happens at Mare Island is that little psychiatric hospital which had uh, beds at eight foot centers uh, ended up having having triple bunks at three foot centers and they still didn't have enough room for the psychiatric patients so they leased this new hospital this was going to be a this was going to be a TB sand at um, at uh, Napa State Hospital they leased that 200 bed facility to take care of their more most seriously mentally ill patients now one other kind of sweet thing about Maryland is we had visitors Lots of visitors, lots of famous visitors. And this is one of my favorite pictures. This is Eleanor Roosevelt visiting. And, and there are two stories here, I think. Look at the nurses. They're leaning in. They're delighted. They're happy that she's here. The president's wife is here to see us. Look at the officer, the commanding officer of the hospital. I would venture he's a Republican. <laughs> and the look is, I'm too busy to be doing this kind of work. The other is the fellow in the circle there is Bob Hope, Bob Hope. So Bob Hope was here. And there were many, many others. Um, here we go. Mayor Island becomes famous also as, as, as it was designated the West Coast Amputation Center uh, uh, for Marines and the Navy. Mayor Island, again, this is another Mayor, Mayor Island innovation story. Um, this is a Navy shipyard. You got access to two things that are not accessible on the outside. One is modern materials, plastics. The other is you've got a, a, a you've got a a, 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 sh a whole lot of very experienced machinists who can machine these very intricate artificial joints. There's an ar there was a letter in the uh, in the file of uh, of an army doc from Letterman writing back to his bureau saying I was overlooking at the Mare Island operation the other day and I got to tell you. The prosthetics they're making there are vastly better than anything we have at about a third the cost. Go Navy, beat Army. Divine capacity 600 war at, during the war on eight foot centers, peak capacity of 2300 on four foot centers. In other words, they put the beds much closer together to fit the folks in. Now, you have to remember one thing. The acuity at this time is not like the acuity in hospitals today. These guys are not necessarily sick. They just have got to have a place for a bed, a roof, and food until they get better enough to either go back to the fleet or be discharged from the hospital, discharged from the Navy. So that's, I mean, that's part of the deal. Now I'm getting the, I'm getting the, the hint here. The, the, the end of, the, well, and we're coming to the end of the story. The end of the war, there's a rapid demobilization. Patients want to go home. They want to go to hospitals nearby. We're going to build that other hospital at Oak Knoll. The bed capacity goes down to 1,046. Uh, now, th this is, I like this, the hospital, the, the, the Navy announces that they want to close the hospital. Um, Vallejo has a very effective uh, uh, lobbying organization back in D.C. at that time, and the CEO of the hospital remi reminds the Surgeon General that Vallejo is going to fight like crazy to keep the hospital open. Well, it works, I mean, with a little help from the Korean War, but by 15 October 1957, the Naval Hospital closes. Uh, they run a clinic out of the hospital for a while, and then they build another clinic. But that's the end of the Naval Hospital on Mare Island. This is the picture of the facility at its peak. 
I'll point this structure. Well, I'll point this structure out. This is the last World War II construction on the Navy Yard. Um, it's uh, you'll see it in these pictures. Uh, we'll go back to the pastor's prologue. This is a Waves Barrack building being built in 1943, I believe, and it's now one of your administrative buildings. Uh, this building here is the last World War II construction. It was a, a, a recreational facility. Uh, named Owen Hall by the Navy after the hospital commander, the World War II hospital commander's name, Owen. Uh, now Lander Hall, you'll recognize it as Lander Hall. And then finally, this lovely facility, H-78 up on the hill, it was the nurses' quarters, and it became your, it became your main administration building, and I think there's a student lounge in there too. What I love about this story, this building, there are two things I love. One is standard Navy construction is square or rectangle. How in heaven's name did a Y-shaped building ever get into this thing? It was controversial at the time, but it proceeded. The other thing is, I love the Spanish Revival style of these things. Back in those days, the Navy could actually make things look pretty as well as be functional. End of my talk. Thank you for your rapt attention. We might have a minute for a question or two. You can catch me. Aha, we have to evacuate we have to evacuate the place. All right. Thank you.